Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. This is why so many people feel so unfulfilled. The world's problem is that it has failed at commandment number one. Hello everyone, welcome or welcome back to 828 with Kate. I'm your host, Kate Taylor, and today I want to talk about something that I have been feeling a little bit convicted about. And I wonder how many of you may be in the same boat. If you were to ask yourself right now, is God number one in your life? Could you honestly say yes? And if the answer is no, may I pitch it to you that that may be the reason why your life is in disarray. That may be the reason why you are more anxious than you need to be. That may be the reason why you're lacking peace, why you're lacking confidence, why you are overly stressed about the outcome of certain things, and why overall you are lacking contentment. Because God is the author of life itself, he created a specific order to things that must be obeyed and followed, otherwise all of those things fall apart. So when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the very first commandment was this, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. God has a right to tell us this because of who he is and what he has done for us. Who else has saved us from our sin? Who else could deserve number one place in our life than the one who lived and died for us? And if we fail at keeping commandment number one to keep God first, we will inevitably fail at all of the rest. Because the second commandment he gives is this, you shall not make for yourself a carved image any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. What does this mean to make an image for ourselves of something in heaven above? It means that we start to look at something as if it's God, as if it's our primary source of contentment and satisfaction. And this is naturally going to happen when we take God off of that top spot in our lives, when he is no longer number one, when you no longer love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Something else is going to fill that spot. Something or someone is going to start taking over your heart, your soul, and your mind instead of him. And when this happens, you have just made that thing or that person into the image that he said not to make. And another word for image is idol. An idol is an object of extreme devotion, a false god, a likeness of something, a pretender, an imposter, a form or appearance visible but without substance. In other words, it's something we serve, worship, prioritize, and look to as if it can fill our soul with satisfaction, but because it's just an image, it's not the real thing, it has no substance. It can never actually fulfill us. And look around, this is the state of the world we are in. This is why so many people feel so unfulfilled, no matter how many material things they accumulate. The world's problem is that it has failed at commandment number one. Romans 1.25 says they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. And it's not just non-Christians who do this. 
All throughout the Bible, we see the Israelites who were God's people. They believed in God, but they would continuously make for themselves false gods and false idols. They would get tired of waiting on God and waiting on his promises, so they would turn to other things in the meantime. In Exodus chapter 32, we even see them take all of their gold earrings and form them into an idol in the shape of a calf. Then they bow down and worship this golden calf. The Israelites' problem wasn't that they didn't serve God. Their problem was that the commandment was to worship the Lord your God and serve him only. But God was never enough for them. They always had to have God plus something else. So God says to them, do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. And you might think, that's wild. They bowed down and worshipped a golden calf instead of God. Come on. Well, you can make an idol out of anything. It doesn't have to be silver or gold. How often do we find ourselves devoted to God plus something else? We find some of our security and our contentment in God, plus we find some of it in our job and our bank account. We give some of our love to God, plus we give a whole lot more of it to the person that we're dating. And anything that you put in God's rightful place instead of him is as silly as a golden calf. You want to know why? Let's go back to the Israelites. They eventually end up in a scary situation that they cannot get themselves out of. And who do you think they cry out to in their moment of desperation? I'll give you a spoiler. It's certainly not the golden calf. When they get stuck, they call out to God. And he says, but you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Go and cry to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you in your time of trouble. Maybe to this generation, he would say, go cry to your crystals that you claim have all this power. Cry out to your tarot cards or your bank account or your relationship or even to yourself. All these things that we look to and worship and idolize instead of him. When he is the only one who is actually deserving and worthy of our worship. We can easily see what we idolize by looking at what we prioritize. For example, the past little while, I have found myself saying, I don't have time to read my Bible today because I'm too busy. I'm slammed with work. I have to do laundry. I need to write a message for the podcast. I have a date night. I don't have time. I think that's the reason a lot of us would give, despite the fact that the reason we have a job is because God provided one. The reason we have a ministry is because God blessed us with one. The reason we can go on a date night is because God gifted us with that relationship and yet we pay him no mind. We're too busy focusing on the gifts rather than the giver. We're too busy loving created things rather than the creator himself. And here's the thing. Here's my conviction for the week. If you say you don't have time to spend with God, go on your phone right now, click settings, and check your screen time. That's all I'm going to say. We all have the time. We could all spend five minutes in the morning thanking God for our blessings. We could all read a chapter of the Bible in our lunch break instead of scrolling Instagram. Time isn't our problem, it's our priorities. And I heard this quote a while ago that applies this to all areas of life. It says, instead of saying, I don't have time, try saying it's not a priority and see how that feels. Often, that's a perfectly adequate explanation. I have time to iron my sheets, I just don't want to. But other things are harder. Try it. I'm not going to edit your resume, sweetie, because it's not a priority. I don't go to the doctor because my health is not a priority. And we could add to that, I don't spend time with God 
because it's not a priority. If these phrases don't sit well, that's the point. Changing our language reminds us that time is a choice. If we don't like how we're spending an hour, we can choose differently. Now, the point of this video is not to bash us all over the head with the Bible and guilt and shame us into reading the word. Guilt is not from God. So if you're feeling that right now, let it go. The enemy is the one who uses guilt to cause self-loathing and despair. He tells us that we're useless, we're a failure to God because we can't even pick up our Bibles. He wants to shame us so much that we run even further from God, but that's not how God speaks to us as a father. It doesn't matter how far we've been or how long we've been gone, our Heavenly Father is delighted when we come home to Him, when we come back into that proper alignment, that proper order of things. So God doesn't guilt us into doing things. Instead, the Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit is like a best friend who calls us higher for our benefit and for the benefit of others. The Holy Spirit urges you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So when you feel that conviction, I should read the word, I should go to church, know that the Holy Spirit prompts you because he sees and knows all of the potential that you have within you and the life that you could live. He wants us to grow in our knowledge of him because we become more spiritually mature and more effective for the kingdom. He also wants to see us fulfilled, truly fulfilled. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Do you know that there are scientific benefits to reading the Word of God? There was an extensive study done on this. 40,000 people between the ages of 8 and 80 were asked about their Bible reading habits. And they found that when people engage with the Bible at least four times a week, feeling lonely drops 30%. Anger issues drop 32%. Bitterness in relationships drops 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Sex outside of marriage drops 68%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Viewing corn drops 61%. But here's the thing I found really interesting about this study. They found that the people who read the Bible between one and three times per week indicated basically the same effect on their personal lives as those who do not engage at all. What does this tell us? We were not made to just check in with God every now and then. We were made to be in constant communion with him. We were created to be in constant fellowship with God. We are not built to be separated from him. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. That is the purpose of life. To know God and to love God above all else, above all other distractions in life. We see an example of this in Luke chapter 10 with the story of two sisters, Mary and Martha. Jesus and his disciples were coming to their village and it says Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. 
but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. I feel like often I'm Martha. I get so busy working and doing things for God, sometimes at the expense of my relationship with him. And if you look at this story in the context of your own life, what were the things that you were distracted by today? Were you worrying about money or stressed about work or maybe you were just busy with your own pursuits? Jesus says, few things are needed or indeed only one. Sitting at his feet, that's what you need in your life more than anything else. You don't need a new car or a new house. You don't need to get married or to have more savings in your bank account in order to feel satisfied. Those things are all blessings that God wants us to enjoy while recognizing them as blessings and keeping them in the correct place in our hearts, keeping things in the correct order with God still as number one. Because if we don't find our true satisfaction in God, all those things will come up short when we obtain them. If you don't believe me, please read the book of Ecclesiastes. King Solomon had all the riches. He had every worldly thing you could possibly wish for, and this is what he said. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. When we compare this to what King David said in the Psalms, David discovered what Mary had discovered, that the most satisfying path we could ever take in this life is that of pursuing God's presence, sitting at the Lord's feet and listening to what he has to say, King David said, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. I pray that this one thing would become the desire of our hearts too. And that the more we spend time with God, the more we get to know him, the more we would love him. That like David and Mary, we would taste and see that the Lord is good. And there is a song that actually came into my head as I was finishing writing up this message. It's called Nothing Else by Cody Kahn's and I'm going to leave a link to it either in the description box or if you're listening or watching on YouTube, I will leave it in the comments too. Let me know if you listen to it. I think it really sums up this whole message and I love listening to that song just to realign my heart and get my priorities in check. But that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Please consider maybe subscribing or following along if you're new here and you want to hear more faith-based messages like this one. At the moment, I am posting every other week. So until next time, God bless you guys.